Hi everyone. Um, I'm Lauren um, and my research is about the global sand shortage and its relationship to New Zealand architecture. Um, and I know many of you probably haven't heard about this issue, but um, we'll get to that. Um, so as we all know, industrialization and urbanization um, are having huge environmental impacts. Um, which has increasingly drawn global attention to the issues of um, climate change, resource depletion, and accumulating waste. Um, and the demand for material resources extracted has more than tripled between 1970 and 2010. Um, and the largest proportion and most quickly rising proportion um, of this is in non-metallic minerals, which includes sand, um, about a third of it is sand. Um, so sand is second only to water as our most used natural resource and without it we wouldn't have computers, phones, cosmetics, um, roads, reclaimed land, um, glass, concrete um, or even paper. Um, and for most people the sand shortage hasn't crossed their mind um, because we have these huge things called deserts which cover about a third of the earth's land surface. Um, but desert sand isn't useful for construction or manufacturing because of its roundness, um, which is caused by um, the strong winds that you get in desert environments. So it doesn't stick together like rougher beach sand or river sand can. Um, so the extraction of the sand causes major damage to coastlines, um, riverbeds and ecosystems around the world. Um, and sand's formed um, by erosive processes over thousands of years, but it's now being extracted at a rate far greater than its renewal. Um, about three quarters of this extracted sand is locked away in construction and infrastructure, largely due to the industrialization and urbanization that I talked about before. Um, and an example of this is um, China, who have used um, three, in the last three years more sand than the USA did all of last century. Um, so this relates to architecture because sand is a key component of glass and concrete. Um, yet in New Zealand, we're increasingly reliant um, on glass as a key conveyor, conveyor um, of the landscape and freedom and command of space. Um, so this background research has led to my research question being, what are the architectural implications for designing the quintessential New Zealand dwelling for a future with less glass, where the idealized home captures the view of the heroed landscape? Um, and my first task was to evaluate the link between um, successful quintessential New Zealand architecture and its use of glass. Um, so I analysed a range of um, award-winning residential architecture and standard, st standard spec homes and passive houses um, in terms of their glazing use. Um, and what I found was that award-winning homes tended to have um, much higher levels of glazing per square metre than their standard spec and passive house counterparts. Um, and you can see those award-winning houses in the orange at the right-hand side there. Um, and this indicates that architectural success in New Zealand tends to be represented by projects with big windows that use the landscape as a design driver. Um, so my case study analysis has led to this um, design framework being established, um, which has a 15% threshold um, for the use of glass per square metre of building. Um, among other design principles, which I could go over, but I don't have time, um, such as creating texture and shadow through means other than windows, um, positioning and stacking the view, um, and balancing public and private and indoor and outdoor space. Um, so that's kind of where my thesis is at the moment, and I've spent the last few weeks um, on design and working through some design iterations that test that framework. Um, these are just a few of my sketches that um, sort of reflect that framework. Um, and my plan is to create a system of prefabricated sort of enclosure elements like um, windows and doors and other wall openings um, that allow interior spaces to be opened up to the landscape um, and the view with hopefully a lot less glass. Um, that's me, thank you. Cool. Thanks, Lauren. Excellent. Um, Lewis.
Kia ora koutou. So as previously, as previously mentioned, our built environment is contributing to things such as industrialization and urbanization. Um, and as all the previous things mentioned, these are also having huge impacts in polluting our urban soils and water and air. Um, this, this pollution is in turn contributing to climate change and biodiversity loss. So it's therefore the built environment's responsibility to remediate these things. Uh, my project Remediation Architecture is focused on remediating New Zealand's most polluted sites um, and using architecture to do this. Um, it, you know, can it be a way to celebrate these spaces rather than ignore them? The main idea that underpins a lot of this, uh, my research is regenerative design, and it's a way of going beyond sustainability and saying that buildings need to be providing net positive effects for the resources they use. Um, and you can see that green building practices here are still contributing to a degrading system. So we wanna be moving towards a regenerative one. Um, it's important to note that to get to that point, uh, all of the other levels stack up. So we kind of need all of the bits. Um, so my research is focusing on how do we enact restorative design in a way to move, move towards a more regenerative one. Um, and so my, re my research question is, all kind of based around this idea of bioremediation and uh, that's using um, plants and bacteria and fungi to restore and um, restore these sites. So um, the, a lot of these bioremediation techniques are quite industrial uh, and not very friendly to users. So I'm looking at how can we incorporate these into architecture. Um, so initial investigations into a lot of the literature, I found um, particular species that are best evolved to deal with um, these kinds of pollution. So you can see there's a range of bacteria and fungi, as well as plants, they play quite an important role um, and their symbiotic relationships between all of them. This is just a snapshot, there's, there's a lot more. Um, and also did a search of the literature of the different types of bioremediation there is out there. Um, so this is just a, a small selection here. So to investigate these hypotheses or these ideas, I um, picked a site and it's off uh, New Zealand's top 10 most polluted sites at the moment. Um, it's in Petone, it's Temome Stream, um, currently number eight most polluted site. The, the main source of pollution, there's a lot of industrial area around it, but the main source was a battery recycling plant um, was discharging some of their wastes into the stormwater system, which was uh, flowing its way into the stream. So there's a lot of um, pollutants that are you know, similar to that kind of processes. So heavy metals and lead and antimony, those kinds of things. Um, and, and that certain type of pollution brings with a lot of challenges as well. So um, what can we do about it? Um, so I've been investigating a couple of techniques. This first one, bioventing, is um, it's a way of oxygenating the soil deep down by using changes in barometric pressure. Um, and that's to pr promote uh, indigenous microbial activity to pollute these, these things. So. I'm looking at how can we incorporate this into a, a building element or a column. Um, and in order to get people to interact with this, uh, the, the column would light up when it's active um, and not when it's not. Um, another thing I've been looking at is phytoremediation. So that's the use of plants as well as bacteria or fungus. Um, and my, my particular site, uh, you have to be quite careful about disturbing the sediment because that's where a lot of those pollutants drop and lie. So it brings a lot of challenges, um, but you know, how do we create spaces and structures that float above the river and are able, able to remediate these without disrupting this and, and causing too much damage? So this is this concept we're just looking at. Um, and also 
looking at, well, what if we pump this water through a different system? So in this case, a living machine, um, which pumps the wastewater through a very series, various series of uh, tanks that are inoculated with different plants and plants and bacteria and things. So that when we can reintroduce it back into the waterways, it, it'll be cleaned. Um, so obviously there was, there's a very small snapshot of the, of the things that I've been looking at. I'd love to tell you so much more, um, but I think moving forward, I'm looking at trying to bring all these together and, um, and provide almost a, a toolbox for, for dealing with different brownfield sites or most polluted sites around New Zealand. Thank you. Well, thanks, Lewis. Beautiful. Uh, George. All right, I'm George. That's a building. Um, cool. All right, so when I was putting these slides together, I was trying to think about sort of how to get you guys to understand the situation that we're in globally. And um, well, it's kind of like, you know, if you think the earth is like a ship, um, a ship that we're all kind of familiar with, you know, you, you all want the Kate and Leo experience. I mean, we all do, I guess, um, it's natural, but yeah, I don't know, things are kind of sinking. Um, what was the point here? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, they had fun and, you know, they're in love and all that and drew pictures of each other. But, you know, they, Leo died at the end. That was pretty preventable. If they had, like, paid a bit more attention, um, you know, they, they probably would have got on one of the lifeboats and survived. So that was the story there. Um, climate change, yeah, it's bad. We all know it's pretty bad. I don't think any of you are in this room because you don't believe in it. Um, yeah, I think relative to my research, waste and resource scarcity are the biggest factors that I'm dealing with. Um, yeah, just talking about how, how things are pretty, pretty bad generally. And they're just going to get worse, like Emma was saying. Um, yeah, in the construction industry, which, I don't know, me and my colleagues are about to go into, is, you know, as it turns out, one of the worst culprits, which kind of sucks to, to learn about. Um, in New Zealand, we don't even know how bad the waste situation is, but best estimates are, you know, up to half of all waste produced in New Zealand is construction waste. Uh, yeah, you can see there 40% of global resources um, are used in construction, which is pretty bad. Um, and it all sort of goes to waste, you know? It's not really designed for reuse, um, which is, oh, hang on, we'll get to that later. Um, yeah, we're using resources 50% faster than they can be replaced on average. Uh, Water scarcity by 2030, half the world, that's pretty bad. Um, we use water for manufacturing lots of stuff, like steel and concrete, plastics, timber. Um, yeah, so long story thought, uh, short, things have got to change. Um, yeah, so we, we operate in this linear fashion where we build, um, or we design, we build, we occupy, demolish and we dispose of the chuck in landfill whereas we need to be moving towards a circular economy by designing our buildings to be taken apart um, and to be reused or you know adaptable and then don't have to take them apart at all um, yeah either way you need to eliminate waste big time um, Yeah, I mean, point here, you can see number six, landfill should be the last option. Yet, yeah, it's probably the thing we do the most of, right? Um, 
Yeah, so I'm looking at design for deconstruction in construction, uh, eliminating waste through yeah, designing things to go together so that you can take them apart again, essentially. Um, the other thing you sort of need to think about is the fact that recycling in itself, you know, everyone talks about recycling and stuff, but recycling has an embodied energy within itself. It involves a reprocessing or a remanufacturing, and that takes up energy. So if you can design things that don't have to be recycled in the first place, um, you're doing a good thing. Yeah, so my work, I'm um, pretty far behind, to be honest. Still got a lot to do. Um, but hey, you know, it's 2020. Um, what am I doing? Yeah, so I'm designing a deconstructible system made from engineered timber products. So a structural system, walls, floors, you know, what kind of goes together so that it can come apart again and be reused over time in different ways. Um, and at different scales. My uh, initial research involved looking at um, complex, you know, Japanese timber joints and stuff, because I thought they were pretty cool. And they do the best sort of complex timber um, joining stuff. Yeah. Um, that's, that's just about the only image I have so far. I've got a lot of research, but haven't done the visuals yet. Um, yeah, so structural system, walls and stuff. Um, I'm looking at a commercial implementation and then an adaption to residential uh, and then sort of scaling down, potentially industrial, um, going down smaller and smaller scales into small scale residential uh, with those same building components um, and and reusing that system again and again in different ways, eliminating waste, saving materials, you know. Um, yeah, this is kind of what, what you guys should be thinking about um, going into fifth year. There's a lot of sort of stuff in architecture. Uh, a lot of it matters, you know. Some of it doesn't, I think. Um, but sustainable environmental design is, is by far the most urgent thing that you could be doing in fifth year. You know, it's the most immediate challenge that we're facing. Um, and if we want to sort of stay a relevant industry, I think that's definitely a good direction to go in. And yeah, I think that's, that's me. Cool, thanks, George. Uh, next student up is Emily. Okay. Um, so, kia ora everybody. Um, I'm Emily, um, and this is my thesis project, um, Retrofit Regeneration. Um, so retrofit regeneration is a design strategy for an external thermal blanket revitalization of existing housing. Um, the aim is to create warmer, drier, healthier homes without having to displace the occupants while doing so. Um, so as has already been discussed, there's a bit of a problem at the moment, particularly in New Zealand making climate responsive design um, and the global dependence on finite resources. Um, so for many New Zealanders, our housing is negatively affecting occupant health and well-being. Um, our poor living conditions are leading to preventable health issues that are placing pressure on our healthcare systems um, and costing valuable resources. Um, and exposure to mould in homes has been found to have a 14 times increase um, in respiratory related health issues. Um, our existing housing supply in New Zealand is available for reuse. Um, however, 40% of our homes are damp and mouldy and 53% would benefit from insulation. Um, the approach to demolish or fully retrofit requires displacing people from their homes when you do this. 
um, and it increases the demand on more housing and resources while they're displaced. Um, while also with the waste thing to the waste issue that we have. Um, so New Zealand is obligated to reach the 2050 climate goals and to do so, as also mentioned, the 39% carbon emissions by our globally, our construction industry must be mitigated to achieve the net zero carbon housing and sustain the precious resources that we have. Um, currently developments, as identified here, uh, in place to try and aim towards this, but we need to go beyond um, and start thinking about how our role as designers, we can actually do that. Um, so the opportunity that I'm focusing on for my thesis um, is to improve the existing housing stock as a um, readily available resource. Um, and it's a first step that sets the challenge of how best to reuse what we have um, and then positive, positively improve its impact on people, the community and the environment. Um, so as we are aware, our New Zealand standards currently are well below efficient design um, and we need to be aiming far beyond the minimum. Um, the 1940s to 60s New Zealand State House um, has been selected as a common poor condition yet solid and uniform housing typology mass produced in New Zealand. Um, the typical detailing, partial prefabrication materials and details um, provide a good ground for a base model to work from. Um, so some of the issues identified were poor air tightness, lack of insulation, thermal bridging, low performing windows and doors and some worn out cladding. Um, and so this led to the design of a cloak-like strategy that I'm focusing on as an external strategy to the building um, that aims to improve the performance and extend the um, living experience of the home while also limiting occupant disruption while it is implemented. Um, so the aim of the project is to um, create a strategy that can be adapted to different housing houses of the same base typology um, where each house can be 3D scanned um, and then for the details of that home and then the appropriate design response can be applied to each home um, through parametric design um, and prefabrication of the system would help to limit this on-site time, um, material use, time and cost. Um, and so some things I've been looking at with the design to achieve home performance um, and to optimize the everyday function, um, just to explore how the strategy could extend the home experience and be functional as well as also um, the performance of the wall. Um, so for example, I've been looking at maybe seating or storage or connection between inside and out, how you could grow um, planting on the outside, potentially for self-sufficiency, um, and also the effects of biophilia um, and how that can be integrated into the strategy. Um, so then potential material options could range from local timbers or mycelium, which is a fungi um, that can be grow could be grown into an insulating material um, from or maybe recycled plastic to then planting. And just at the moment, I'm trying to suss out what that might look like. Um, and the end goal aims to propose a strategy of potential wall design options that could be combined together um, and collectively form the cloak of the home. So an overall combination of wall elements that could be adapt and change. So yeah, that's me. Thank you. Cool, thanks, Emily. Um, Shannon. Uh, so hello, I'm Shannon, and my research focus is on the architectural implications of uh, mid-rise mass timber structure, and in particular within the context of office working environments. 
And so mass timber describes uh, timber being used in massive uh, sizes, products like CLT, Glulam and LBL. Um, these are highly engineered products that can be exploited in unique ways. And typically they are either utilized as a series of panels, as is often seen in residential architecture, or in a post and beam frame method, typical to commercial developments. And although mass timber is an alternative construction method currently, um, faced with both ethical and legislative changes to the industry, uh, mass timber is in the beginnings of a resurgence. And mass timber products are not only more sustainable than their steel and concrete counterparts, but they're quick to erect uh, prefab friendly and lightweight, and therefore an attractive uh, material for urban construction. And in terms of legislation, um, wider carbon neutral goals are being introduced, and locally we're seeing some changes to procurement. And in terms of our working environments, uh, commercial buildings are the fabric of our urban centres, but the architectural solutions to our workplace needs have not significantly changed since the first kind of international style high rises. And um, new flexible working methods have emerged that require variable spaces and meaningful design, yet our commercial buildings are still tied to the standard kind of open plan steel or concrete grid of columns. And New Zealand has a long standing tradition of utilising timber products for low rise housing. And CLT products in particular have found some success in medium density housing. But uh, timber products have found little success in the mid rise market and even less so in the commercial sector. So, is it kind of time for us to rethink the design of our work environments? And can the use of mass timber as a unique material with its own unique uh, tectonic language enable this change and push us towards reshaping our urban context? And so, moving on to some of the kind of current design outcomes of my own design research. I'm looking at three scales of mass timber implementation in the workplace, the urban planning and detail scales. And so starting off at the urban scale, as mass timber buildings are currently in their infancy, they must fulfill other functions not typically required of the office typology, incorporating urban contributions, monumentality, and presenting the image of sustainability are all methods by which mass timber buildings must seek to prove themselves in the commercial marketplace. And the facade in particular, there's lots of interesting opportunities to kind of move beyond the typical curtain glass wall that we see in standard commercial buildings. And to the planning scale, uh, implicitly incorporating the structural solution, the services scheme, and the overall architectural intent um, into the design outcome has the opportunity to create a cohesive working environment that moves away from the traditional modes of commercial construction. Um, incorporating new methods of working and I'm looking at activity-based working in particular, into the overall scheme, again, presents opportunities to rethink the status quo. And ABW environments in particular require a variety of spaces with differing needs, such as enclosure, exposure, natural lighting, open or public. And being more playful and experimental with the structural components to create these spaces could help to establish mass timber in the commercial scene. And to kind of some more dis, uh, resolved architectural outcomes, this more conservative scheme I've developed looks to utilize already established mass timber panel technology. And this proposal features an eccentric core with a centrally located circulation path, connecting a series of large rooms, with the idea that these rooms provide enough flexibility within the given parameters to allow multiple occupation options and differing architectural qualities. And to my more kind of adventurous scheme, this design looks to utilize uh, layered mass timber panels to create a series of structural arches. And the planning strategy of this concept features an atrium to create urban amenity, a split non-structural core, and a series of inhabitable modules with a circulation path running through the middle of the arch. And to the final scale, the detail scale, uh, developing this finer grain detail beyond the aesthetic towards exploiting the benefits of mass timber and utilizing its inherent, inherent material strengths offers lots of exciting opportunities to really establish mass timber as a unique material with its own unique tectonic language. And so in conclusion, the use of more sustainable materials in our urban centers is inevitable. And the exciting role for research is to question the status quo and suggest new ways these materials could be utilized that are not only beneficial to their wider implementation, but also to the architectural quality of our buildings. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Shannon. Uh, next up is Liam. Hi, 
Um, so I'm Liam, um, and my thesis is titled Growing Out Before Outgrowing. Um, it's based on adaptive housing, um, and the idea is to provide adaptive housing for New Zealand. Um, so basically, it's my view that housing in New Zealand um, has a big unsuitability problem, and the fact that when we decide that we want to solve the housing crisis, our solution is simply to build more houses, and that will fix it. Whereas we're simply um, looking at the solution as to paint everyone with the same brush and just go, you know, this is what's fine. Um, whereas we need to look at housing as a case by case basis and actually look at how we live in these houses and how everybody has a different story which they live within their own house. Um, and so the big issue is that many families, first home buyers and current owners are in a position where if they purchase a house or are living in a house that it will not be suited to them for their entire lifespan, that they are living in an evolving life in a house that is static and cannot change with them. Um, and so I'm trying to look at a way that we can begin to build houses which can allow for change and adaptability very easily. Um, so just looking at some of the problems there, um, where houses have grown exponentially in size, but um, also our national household um, sizes sort of dropped to 2.7. Um, whereas in areas such as South Auckland, it's on the rise and is currently at four persons. Um, so one sort of solution of just building more houses is not going to solve our problem. Um, also, housing in areas such as South Auckland tends to be of lower quality um, as well. And there's issues with crowding um, in houses that is of less quality standard. Um, so in response to this, my question is, how can a designed connection in combination with a prefabricated building system be applied to the construction of houses in New Zealand to create adaptive homes which can change with the occupant during their lifetime? So my goal kind of with this is to look at ways where we can begin with looking at housing as building with what we can afford at the start or what we need at the start and easily being able to add on and adapt based on your life changing life um, positions pretty much. Um, so to begin with, I started looking at how we build houses currently in New Zealand, which is predominantly timber frame. Um, and the big problem with this is that I started then to look at, you know, in further detail, um, you know, what makes up the construction of a house. Um, and the way we build houses is, is totally with, with permanence in mind. They're not designed to change at all to begin with. Um, right down from timber frames is all how to get the nails, um, insulation, waterproofing, and interior and exterior claddings, which are held on with adhesives, which don't um, allow for any change whatsoever. And when you see houses with additions on, they're also added with permanence in mind. They're not meant to be taken away later on when they're not needed. Um, so in response to this, I kind of looked at um, structural systems that are out there that are classified as adaptive, things such as ClickCraft, WikiHouse, um, the X-Frame, um, and a number of solutions that have actually been designed here at the school. And the one problem that I found is that um, while they were an adaptive structural system, they didn't um, keep in mind what keeps um, a structure permanent, which is the um, building envelope. Um, so I went on to kind of design this cassette panel um, to begin with, um, looking at CNC technology in mind so that it can be mass produced easily. Um, I also did a lot of physical structural modeling to begin with as well, looking at the way um, it could be assembled specifically as well, looking um, at sequencing, so how can it can be easily put together. Um, and so that the bits that form the panel are holding themselves together, and so it doesn't need any extra fixings um, to reduce waste in that way. Um, so I came up with sort of early range of cassette panel options, looking at a way that um, they can be designed parametrically to also include options for things like windows. Um, Currently, I'm at a stage where I'm resolving structural issues around what happens when angled panels meet um, ones that are flat. So um, there's a large limitation with the kind of material range that I've chosen um, to get over, which is what I'm kind of working through now. Um, so I'm doing a lot of CNC fabrication testing through that as well. Um, that's sort of some of the jointing that I was working through as well on how to hold these things together without having to use extra fixings. Um, and so then what I am also trying to move into is in a way that we can build houses is not only using a prefabricated structural system, but also looking at a prefabricated services um, system as well. So it's using something designed called the Unipod and where um, 
if you have all your services running through walls, such as um, cables, pipes, um, which wouldn't allow walls to come out and easily be interchanged. Uh, why not having a central services core where all your pipes and everything can run through um, and easily branch out from there so that they're not having to run through the um, design structural system. Also in a way where um, in a house where you have specific design uh, areas such as kitchens, bathrooms, laundries, which all kind of have um, internal linings uh, and waterproofing, which is fixed on with adhesives and um, waterproof linings, which you know would stick to a prefabricated system and then not be able to be taken apart. So kind of moving forward through there. And that's basically where I'm up to at the moment, kind of looking forward to designing houses now with these two kind of systems in mind. Thanks, Liam. Okay, uh, Charlie, right in the middle. Uh, good day, everybody. My name's uh, Charlie, um, and my thesis is titled uh, "Reframing Our Future: uh, Detailing Architecture Beyond the Minimum." Uh, and my research question is: How can architects design beyond the minimum? and increase the thermal performance of our homes by critically reconsidering New Zealand's traditional detailing processes. And so, at, as I'm sure you are aware and heard tonight, New Zealand undoubtedly faces a housing crisis. And although national media likes to focus on the need for more affordable housing at larger scales, I think another issue uh, or a, a major issue that is less often discussed is the poor thermal performance of our home, uh, perpetuated by traditional uh, construction and detailing practices. So, and again, as we've, as we've heard, uh, New Zealand homes are very often cold and damp, and more than three quarters of our homes were built before any min, uh, minimum insulation values uh, were introduced. And often homes today rely on expensive heating systems to uh, maintain comfortable indoor temperatures. And New Zealand's current minimum uh, insulation R values are less than half that required in, in many other developed nations with similar climates. Uh, and so as the, the brands exceeding the minimum research program sort of uh, started to uh, suggest, um, industry often treats our minimum uh, sort of performance standards as uh, targets instead of something that should be exceeded. Um, and as a result, New Zealanders are, are really quite unaware of what a high performing house is actually like to live in um, and that it can uh, provide significant um, health um, benefits as well as reducing um, operational costs and, and use of energy. And proposed changes to the building code in the near future will require designers to think differently about designing uh, or detailing the thermal envelope in order to comply with new uh, energy efficiency regulations. Uh, and so sort of at the start of my research, I again looked at um, uh, similar to Lauren um, NZI award-winning homes. Uh, and, and basically I was looking for how designers reconcile performance and um, architectural intent. Uh, and sort of some of the, the uh, uh, findings from this is, uh, again, that the, the yeah, so, um, sorry, I'm just lost when we placed it, that, yeah, suggests that, so highly, even these highly um, celebrated examples of residential arch uh, architecture give little consideration to improving performance beyond um, minimum standards, and priority is instead given uh, to achieving the architectural elements that make these projects so special, uh, often large glazing elements, uh, and thin wall sections, which contribute um, to, to heat loss through um, thermal bridging and, and little insulation. So as part of the solution to this issue, um, this thesis aims to demonstrate how highly efficient uh, thermal envelope detailing can be achieved in line with architectural design objectives. And the research focuses on exploring the potential design outcomes of an architectural process that integrates high performance detailing strategies, uh, thermal bridging simulation into the conceptual phase of a project. And the process aims to reintroduce the detail as a design generator instead of a design outcome, uh, meaning that thermal performance becomes inseparable from architectural intent and in turn facilitating greater meaning within residential architectural detail and allowing architects opportunities to improve the performance um, of our homes. And so basically I'm looking at three projects that sort of um, uh, summarize the, the typologies uh, of residential architecture in New Zealand, a batch, a townhouse and a detached house. And I'll just quickly run through uh, where I'm sort of, the, the design outcomes for two of those at the moment. Uh, so the first is a, 
uh, a batch in Le Bon's Bay in the Canterbury region. So Canterbury is the, the focus of the research. Um, and uh, there's a long history of batch um, design in, in New Zealand architecture and contemporary architects are, are looking to draw from that heritage as well as relate to the, the special qualities of, of a place that these batches often find themselves in. So that third image there is of a church in Le Bon's Bay, um, uh, St Andrew's Church, which won an Enduring Architecture Award last year. So when I visited the site, I saw this um, project and really liked that stained glass window and integrated into the facade and thought it could be a detail that I continue with. And so I'm using a SIPS or a structurally insulated panel system uh, in this uh, design. And so the important things with uh, SIPS is to ensure that you're getting the most out of the system with minimal waste of um, panel components and simplified junctions. Uh, and so by designing uh, the floor plan around a strict module uh, and then reducing one panel uh, out of the side of each module, um, I'm able to create these sort of slit windows that on the outside start to speak of the system's requirements and on the inside start to form a relationship to the locale in terms of that uh, church down the road. And the second project is uh, Raora Court. Um, so this is a project in the east frame of Christchurch's new uh, inner city development. Uh, and it's on a brownfield site, which is very common at the moment. So as I'm sure you're aware, uh, after the earthquake, uh, Christchurch lost a lot of its um, uh, heritage architecture, uh, primarily made out of uh, concrete. Uh, and that was pioneered by uh, Warren Amani and Peter Bevan in the early 60s and 70s, and sort of spoke to this, this new style that, that they envisioned Christchurch being. Um, but since the earthquake, that sort of started to be replaced. Uh, and some architecture makes uh, gestures to uh, that previous heritage, but a lot of it is based um, around uh, or, or disregards that heritage completely in terms of um, producing affordable or low cost housing. Uh, and so the design process, I looked for materials or systems that had some relation to that past and again landed on CLT. Uh, and I liked how um, CLT uh, interior could be exposed um, to form some kind of relationship to that exposed concrete of the previous generation. Uh, and the thickness required of the external insulation on the outside um, can be used to start creating some relief um, and depth which characterise that previous architecture. Um, yeah, so that's sort of where I'm at at the moment. I think the, the key sort of thing maybe for you guys to take away is that I don't think sustainable design has to be um, any less than, than non-sustainable and these uh, systems that are, that are coming out of have, as a right for exploration um, and uh, just cool. Thanks, Charlie. Okay, and the last student is Tim. Thank you. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Tim, and this is called Cohabitate. So we currently design architecture for humans. So why don't we design architecture for our ecosystems simultaneously? So especially when they're the ones that are at risk. Uh, firstly, I looked at the synanthropic space, and this is the area in which certain species inhabit on the outer reaches of our human existence. Therefore, the goal is to design in this space interventions that will better an ecosystem and generate ecological growth. So this asks the question, how can nature-based solutions influence architectural design strategies focused on the adaption of coastal urban environments to allow for this cohabitation? In terms of choosing my site, I started with the context of Seaview out in Petone, and then began to look at the species that inhabit this area. And once their habitats were defined and located, uh, this formed the site radius and the interventions can be designed from there. A coastal location was chosen due to the level of natural interaction in this area, as this is the habitat with the largest ecosystem in New Zealand, inhabited by a diverse range of species. As a largely industrial area, Seaview is made up of brown sites, quarry works, petrol processing, and commercial use buildings. So not all that effective for ecosystem regeneration. Therefore, how can spaces be designed better to be more inclusive for all species? One way I began to look at this was by reviewing relevant precedents and judging them on their design intervention, innovation rather, uh, regenerative capacity and their evolution and resilience. So there are a range of cases 
uh, but it became more about drawing up the effectiveness of each against these categories. It turned into a guideline of the best possible ways to encourage biodiversity and design in ways that the architecture can actually become a part of the regenerative system. This way, the design can add to it in some way rather than just being an object that sits in the landscape. In terms of the physical habitats, these represent current local ecologies and potential ecologies that could be situated in Seaview itself. Uh, the kelp beds and the aquifer seeps down on the bottom, uh, these are habitats in Seaview that need to be protected. So the idea behind this type of design is the modification of the anthropogenic environment in such a way so that non-human biodiversity is encouraged whilst not discouraging human interaction. The habitat framework gathers the information from the study and presents it as an understanding of how the habitat can be regenerated through ideas like microhabitat cultivation and extending the edge of buildings. The edge itself could be a small detail or the architecture itself, but it's about creating protection through habitat rather than an empty design mimicking the wrong kind of habitat. Uh, take this design in the center. It's about extending the riparian vegetation along the edge of this current building in Sydney. And this will eventually move through the building as it becomes a part of the ecosystem. I wanted to leave you guys with this point that design should cultivate habitat through the regeneration of, eco of the ecosystem and become more inclusive for all species so that architecture can, be can begin to play an active role. Ultimately, human interventions should be designed not only to house humans and their activities, but also generate or mimic habitat, particularly of local systems, so that these species can be protected, but also begin to thrive alongside humans. The synanthropic space is not being understood or inhabited to its full potential and can be designed much more strategically. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Okay, that is us. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, the students that presented tonight um, will be available for you to have a conversation with now if you'd like to, but if you'd like to get in touch about your research projects or going forward, um, send an email to the New Zealand Green, Green Building Council and they will get in touch um, or um, talk to the supervisors and academic staff there. Cool, thank you all very much. Good night. Thank you.